the idea of the, the series of events is to have discussion panels on topics that are relevant for us as PhD students. So the idea is really that we PhD students organize these events for a group of PhD students at Opsi Border Wider community. So my name is Florian Albein. I'm organizing this workshop and the whole series of events organized with me, Kari Kostin and Antti Müller, who both have excellent panels in the works, so watch out for more. But we decided to start the year with a bit of naval gazing and look at the role of information systems in the context of management, uh, which is sort of a traditional thing for us as a discipline to do. I think from the beginning, information systems was always sort of placed between various disciplines and always thinking about its status, how it relates to them, what exactly it does. And we thought it was interesting to discuss at this point because we just had some changes in the organization where we used to be the information systems group within the department of management. Now we're still a group, but I don't actually know exactly what we are. So I think some of our panelists can elucidate a little bit. And what we're really interested in is to yeah, learn more about the, the area of management research as a whole and how we relate to that. So we do have an excellent panel today. And first speaker, I think, will be Kesanti Afkaru, who is one of our professors and who was one of my first influences in the area of information systems. So she wrote a book with Tony Comfort in I think, 1993, which I read a long time ago, and which I thought was still surprisingly relevant considering it was written at a time when not even the World Wide Web existed, so that's pretty cool. And I thought it was the IS 470. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other reason why she's a great panelist is that she wrote this paper also a long time ago called Information Systems, What Sort of Science Is It? Which I still use regularly to hit people who want to know exactly what we're doing here. And so far at least nobody has complained about it, so it's still a good paper. So I'm very interested in hearing her perspective on things. Then I think second in the row we'll have Carsten, who is great to have on the panel because he's an overall interesting guy, but I think what I, what's mainly good to have him here is because he does very practically relevant research and has a lot of experience working in projects in the outside world, consulting, etc. So I guess we have the element of information systems as an applied science, and it's going to be interesting to hear about that. And I'm extra glad that we have Michael Barsley here, who's the head of the Department of Management and Professor for Public Management. And I hope a lot of you remember him from last year when he came to one of these sessions and did a session about how to do a case study, which I thought was really interesting and useful. And was maybe for many of us the, the first sign that not every management researcher lives in a completely different universe from ours, because I think there is at least the prejudice in our group that the rest of the Department of Management does very different research, which is more focused on quantitative analysis, positivism, etc. So from that perspective, it's going to be interesting to have him here and from a lot of other perspectives as well. So um, what we usually, usually do is to ask everybody to speak for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, and then we're going to have a discussion among the panel and between you and the panel. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm going to hand over the stage to Kesanti, our first speaker. Thank you, Perry. What I will do is that I will give you first an overall view of the field of IS. And then I will give you some um, my own description and understanding of information systems uh, at the uh, LSE. I uh, will end up with uh, a couple of comments, my own understanding of um, where are we in terms of some weaknesses, limitations, and where I would like us to go as part of the Department of Management. Um, so, first, the information systems field in relation to management. Well, they couldn't be more related than they have always been. The original name of information systems was, and still is in many places, management information systems. And in the US and in the new universities, because there is a flourishing uh, academia now in East Asia, uh, information systems is uh, studied in business schools, very much in association with uh, management and very much producing knowledge 
um, to inform management executives. Uh, there is a kind of executive that is more, we are supposed to be the one that we are informing, the senior information officer, the CIO, but more generally, it's uh, in the business schools, information systems is very much involved in the production of knowledge with this kind of practical orientation, what does uh, management need to know about information technology, innovation, development of systems, producing wealth from uh, deploying information systems and innovating. But there are very interesting exceptions in uh, uh, the US, and probably we are closer as uh, a group here than a seat to them. And this is uh, research done as part of the HCI community, the human computer interaction, and in information, schools of information. So uh, we have been closer, uh, it's interesting, to some scholars who started from information systems and business schools. They became increasingly unhappy there, and then they moved and they have been implemented influential in schools of information. Rob Klink, John King, for example. Um, in Europe, uh, the IS field is more diverse in terms of its location and its um, faculty uh, allegiances. Uh, yes, of course, it exists in business schools, but it is very often, uh, much more than in the US, uh, linked with uh, computer engineering. And that happens very often, it's a bit hidden, as I understand, under this uh, uh, term informatics. Um, probably Karsten uh, will correct me here because this is a term that more used in uh, Scandinavian countries, but I think this is um, more computer science and information systems rather than business schools and information systems. Um, but information systems research happens in departments of economics in some places in Europe and uh, also very often historically has been linked with uh, operations research. The research focus, uh, in terms of research agenda, of mainstream IS, is very much, has an obvious orientation towards uh, management, with topics, for example, decision support systems, a uh, you know, long-standing research stream, decision sciences, very much how we make decisions in organizations, part of the job of uh, management. Strategy, planning, um, managing systems development uh, projects, although uh, even there, uh, our core expertise for information systems started and it continues to a large extent to assume an organizational environment where we, uh, we develop knowledge for developing systems that meet the requirements of organizations. So organizational focus, uh, developing technologies that support uh, managerial uh, decisions and the support the uh, production uh, process and the various functions of organizations. Increasingly though, it's the nature of our research set that we are exposed to phenomena that um, where technology enables processes that cross organizational boundaries. So we witness, uh, as part of their research, the, uh, the, the organizational boundaries becoming uh, more porous. They, um, so we ended up talking about knowing rather than knowledge management. We talk increasingly about inter-organizational phenomena rather than organizational phenomena with very specific, under the control of uh, specific uh, organizational uh, management. Um, branches of economic research in IS also uh, more and more do research on, say, auctions rather than organizational performance, economic performance. So, um, increasingly the field studies uh, topics like uh, social media, big data, open innovation. However, there is a difference. There is always uh, 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 something in our mind which uh, somehow pulls towards issues of um, how all of this is managed, although we do not assume that it is managed or controlled by unitary organizations. There is a difference 
the way uh, big data is studied in information systems, if you look at the publications of our journals, than how it is studied, say, in sociology or in uh, media. Similarly about social media, similarly about um, uh, open innovation. Epistemologically, the field of IS is very similar to the field of management, at least the view you take of it from its uh, core journals of uh, um, Academy of Management Journal and Academy of Management Review. Predominantly positivistic, with some kind of allowances of alternative epistemologies, particularly um, uh, interpretivist and social constructionist uh, epistemologies. Where we differ, I guess, is that there is part of IS, which is a significant part of, I, of the IS field, that is preoccupied with design science, but design science of technology artifacts. And there, there is a, a unique form of expertise, and these guys who continue to do research on that created a cosmological space for themselves, with publications that argue that this is different from, say, the behavioral analysis uh, and the uh, more uh, managerial analysis of other topics of IS research. So uh, design science in uh, IS is a distinctive uh, stream of research with its own epistemological, methodological uh, conventions. The field started um, a discourse on epistemology in um, early mid 80s. The precursor of the debate um, was, or the, rather the, when the, 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 the debate became uh, commonly um, publicly known in the community, while before it was happening you know, in parts occasionally among similarly minded uh, alternative kind of IS academics, but it became obvious with the conference in Manchester uh, in uh, 1984, September 1984, organized by Enid Mumford, and uh, all the good and the great of the IS field were, uh, of that time were there, the Gordon Davis from uh, Minnesota, with Dick Bolland, etc., etc., and they raised the huge issue how good, uh, how well the positivist epistemology can serve this field uh, of research and open the gates for talking about alternative epistemologies. And that gradually created room for the acceptance of interpretivism and gradually led to more and more thinking and debate on social constructivism. By the way, that was also the uh, conference that launched the I-5842 uh, uh, working group, which is a series of, uh, of, of conferences very much allowing this kind of pluralism uh, of epistemology. So gradually the field has come to be A, uh, knowledgeable and aware of epistemology uh, and to allow the publication of non-positivistic, uh, interpretivist uh, research um, accounts and findings. But to my understanding, this has been achieved with big compromises. Big compromises in the sense that to be able to appease the positivist that are the majority, we ended up um, adopting conventions to show that we uh, are rigorous, to show that we know what we are doing. So uh, we ended up uh, deploying some simple devices, for example, having loads and loads of quotations, uh, so that there, and there is a common expression so that the reader can see with their own eyes what we learned in the field. These are simplistic things, I think. If you go to other fields like sociology, like anthropology, where they do practice routinely and seriously these sort of epistemologies, they don't need uh, tens of quotations to prove that actually they have data. Uh, they allow themselves to get into the real thing of interpreting and understanding and exploring uh, various ways uh, of uh, problematizing a phenomenon understanding and getting into the real business of uh, theorizing. This is a nuisance, I think, because once these uh, kind of patterns and conventions are developed, 
which uh, I think are very restrictive, they are very difficult to uh, open up and create intellectual depth. I feel that we have been a little bit trapped there with generations of reviewers who uh, have been trained in this, so we are always coming across these kind of review comments that, oh, it should be that and that, so and so, to be accepted as um, methodologically uh, well done. At the LSE, um, our origins uh, are back in 70s uh, with systems analysis and design uh, courses and uh, programs. Uh, Admis, for example, the analysis design and uh, management of information systems was uh, designed uh, by Frank Lang and uh, Ronald Stamper and others at that time, um, centering on uh, systems analysis and design, very much thinking that they are training systems analysts. At that time, armies of systems analysts and designers were needed by the industry, and they therefore uh, were satisfying this kind of labor uh, demand. We, had, we are, were part of the larger department of um, uh, statistics, mathematics, and OR, if you can believe it. And uh, we had very clear, close links with uh, OR. So these are our roots, and we were part of SAMS uh, until 1991 when we became an independent department. And with that independence, I think we gained freedom and we went towards what I would call our golden era, where we uh, have developed uh, a clear identity and visibility in the IS field more generally as a, uh, a, a cluster of academics following an interpretivist epistemology and studying uh, a research agenda which uh, was slightly different from the mainstream. These things go together. You have an alternative epistemology slightly that the questions that are meaningful are slightly different. That happened under the influence of uh, some interesting, well-known by now scholars who happened to be here initially, Frank Land, but also Rudy Hirschheim, uh, Kali Littinen, were people who in the 80s were very influential in strengthening this kind of orientation rather than uh, something which was more mainstream uh, in the way that I described earlier on. Um, our reputation initially was, uh, was in systems analysis, uh, sorry, in the socio-technical uh, systems approach for systems development and more generally for understanding technology and work, the Tavistock uh, influence. As I said, in the 1990s, um, when we became an independent department, we gradually came to create links with other parts of the school. So a main influence came from the rest of the school, with the strongest during the Gibbons era. When Gibbons came here, um, in a way he appointed other scholars in other departments that had a strong interest in technology and, not surprisingly, very much studying it in the way that we were studying. So people in sociology, people in media, like um, um, Silverstone, Silverstone, no, uh, Roger Silverstone, yes, exactly at that time, um, we were speaking the same language, we were talking, we were uh, uh, studying the same issues, but as I said, we always had this organizational uh, uh, focus as a unit of analysis, they had tended to have the macro uh, <coughs> level approach. But uh, yeah, another uh, area of the LSC with which we were very closely um, uh, related and it was very influential was the CAR, the Center of Analysis of Risk. Again, uh, scholars uh, studied risk very much uh, in the way um, we studied uh, technology and the risk that uh, it implies. We then became also related with uh, another, uh, another trend in the social sciences, that of the STS, the study of uh, science and technology. 
and uh, uh, part of that era where we were developing how the area uh, knowledge in this area was the time that Latour was part of us. He came as a visitor at the RSC and he resided here uh, for a couple of years. He used to take the train every week from Paris and come here and stay for a couple of days to uh, teach and uh, we had very interesting uh, Indians. That obviously affected our research agenda. So we had, I think, a broader, slightly broader um, research domain than the mainstream business school-based IS. Theoretically, um, we are more theoretically oriented rather than empirically oriented. And uh, I think this has, uh, over the years, created something that, of, uh, uh, a trend, which I consider as uh, a limitation. Uh, and I'll say uh, what this is in a minute. But that's where we were quite proud about what uh, we were doing, very much recognizable, recognizable uh, internationally. If you go to IES uh, conferences, we are uh, seen as very distinctive, the uh, proponents or the, the experts on this social theory-oriented research in uh, IT and social organizational change. Um, that's where we were when the Department of Management was uh, created and we had to learn to coexist with other colleagues. Uh, some of them we had links before, most of them we hadn't ever worked with. And we, it was clear that epistemologically we were different, although in terms of uh, interests, substantive interest, research interests, we were not that very different. So I think that uh, at the moment, and how both the Department of Management and we ourselves have developed, there is, and there is, there is actually, but there is much more potential for uh, uh, complementarity and genuine, creative, constructive collaboration with our colleagues in uh, the Department of Management. This, I believe, uh, can come and should come by us bothering and focusing much more with substantive research rather than being so obsessed, I should say, with theoretical uh, research and theoretical uh, contributions. I believe that it is a weakness of us that we do not engage very openly and very purposefully with uh, substantive documentation. So, for example, we have much more to say about the process of doing things rather than what actually happens with IT. This makes our arguments weak and we tend to defend our arguments, argumentation, with uh, theoretical integrity rather than with the validity of uh, the uh, resulting uh, argument. If, uh, as I would like us uh, to see, we move towards more a substantive uh, orientation to uh, research and research agenda on things of digital innovation because now it's very clear that we are dealing with digital innovation as a bunch of phenomena that overlap with organizational uh, activities and to a large extent uh, go beyond organizational borders. If we take therefore the emerging innovation uh, identity as we are dealing with digital innovation and we engage with substantive issues, research questions in that area. I believe that we have a lot to say. I believe our epistemology is valuable, but I think that that requires and, and benefit from more exposure and more relationship and more debate with other colleagues here and elsewhere that study the same questions from alternative epistemologies. And I will say one final thing about epistemology. I think it is becoming fashionable to have multi-method uh, approaches. I believe uh, uh, you can have multi-method uh, studies, but within uh, the same epistemology, as an individual researcher. Because it, it becomes a way of thinking. 
However, as a group, you can, uh, I think, fruitfully have, as a community, as a set community, you have, can fruitfully have uh, multiple epistemologies and debates. And as an individual, you can have multiple methodologies within the same uh, epistemology. You can uh, open it to discussion, but that's my own personal view of the field, and I ask the Thanks, because that really interesting. Yeah, I, I knew a lot about the history of our subject, but even I learned a lot from the text in there, so it was really nice to hear. Um, the idea is we, we're going to have a Q&A session in the end, so unless there's something you can't wait to ask for something now, I suggest we hand over to Carsten. Yeah. I'm sure my cold and coughing will not allow me 15 minutes without uh, falling over on the floor, so I will uh, hopefully uh, get through most of it. So I'm going to start just explaining my own career, which is a good illustration of the field of information systems, I think. Because I started as a computer scientist, well, a mathematician, a computer scientist, and then I spent, um, uh, during, my, during my PhD, we were sort of the soft guys, the IS guys were the soft guys in the computer science department, which was full of, of purely technical concerns. Uh, it was purely, you know, from a constructive epistemology. So they built stuff, or thought about how to build stuff, and cared relatively little about the effect of that stuff. And uh, so I roughly spent half of my 25 years uh, uh, working in this field as being this soft guy in this really hard science place, or the one of the few people who are interested in the hard science stuff in a very soft community. So, uh, so when I um, when I got my first job after my PhD, I ended up in a research lab where I was convinced that I was the guy. As in the previous place, I would know a little bit about Heidegger, maybe not as much as, uh, as Edgar and others, but I knew my Heidegger enough, and I knew some other stuff, my philosophy, and then I get to work with philosophers who knew much more about Heidegger. But I knew, it turned out, I discovered that what I really knew about was LLR one passing. But I knew how you build a compiler, what a compiler was, what a program was, so I realized what I'd learned. I only realized that by talking to the other guys. Um, and in the same way, you know, um, the, the, the field of information systems, I think, has this massive identity crisis, which, of course, all fields have, if they have any sense. Namely, what, what is it we know? And there's been a lot of discussions about how we as a field have been very good at borrowing social theories, but we have so far not really put a lot back into the kitty here. And my argument would be that we have a lot to put back in the kitty. We just have to understand, and for those of you from outside England, a kitty is what you put your money in when you go to the pub. And uh, by round, so the kitty is the common, the common pool of money or indeed insights. And and this, our field, as many other new fields, we have been very, very good at borrowing from very interesting people. And I'm not going to try and belittle the people we borrow from. I'm merely saying that we we need to think about how we can at least attempt to put something back uh, again. And the point there is, and if I, my starting point would be uh, when I was an external examiner for Ola Hinford on PhD many years ago. I think it was 99. He's uh, now a professor at Warwick Business School, and I'm going there next week to present uh, for him. But the point is, his PhD was about this problem in IS, namely the container view of the organization. So his PhD was about how IS researchers study organizations, but they have this container view that doesn't really grasp the richness of what organizations are. And I would say, fair enough, all that was very good point, well made. I would say that in the same way when I talk to or read stuff from people from outside IS and unfortunately also a lot of people within IS, we have a black box view of technology or a tool view or a view that for me doesn't express the richness of possibilities or theoretical depth in what really uh, we can study. So I think that's why I, I would uh, continue from where Crescenti left and say that I'm, I'm not an IS person, I might go to IS conferences, but I see myself as, I want to be an expert in digital innovation. And for me, that is not so much a, a program of a procedure for what I should do, other than it's the guiding principle that, that if I study something, then I would try to extract what is the particular characteristics I can draw from this from the participation of various kinds of uh, digital technologies in some sort of ensemble or, 
or arrangement. Uh, so in a sense, I, I would choose not to do uh, what many IS uh, research have done in the past, to do like a typical implementation study of technology, and you could, in a sense, you could change that technology from an information system to a manufacturing process or to um, uh, an organizational um, um, strategic move to change the way the organization made decisions and in a way the way you would, dis you, would dis you would decide about how to study that would not necessarily vary a lot. It would be sort of an organizational, <coughs> an organizational process and whether it involves technology or not or IT or not would not necessarily be the, the driving force in how you design that study. So I would tend to see myself as being an expert in trying to really uh, do the almost impossible of trying in, in the mixture, in the really close um, mixture or uh, imbrication, as you could say, of the social and the technological, to really try and say, so what can we say about this arrangement that, that is different because there's digitality? And I, 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 just a very small example that some of you, but it's very simplistic, but might help us to understand this. I can take an area that I, uh, that I have spent a little bit of time looking at, namely the production and distribution of music. I used to be an amateur musician. I loved it. I never made any money from it. Uh, so it was, uh, it was uh, like when you were in academics. <laughs> this is like being an academic, except uh, most academics, they don't, not only they get paid later, but they start having a debt before they even begin exercising their hobby. So if you look at if you look at the role of digital technologies, then we, we, we all know that most people in here they I just did a straw poll with our master students, where I have a room full of, of our MISTI students and I asked how many in here buys music? And there was one woman who says, once in a while I will buy a bit of music. And I says, How many here is paying for a streaming account? And there was 40 people who paid. It was all all Spotify. So this idea like this simple notion that in the production and distribution of music that when, when, um, when Philips and Sony, they uh, joined forces and joined intellectual property to invent the CD player, they thought that was a match made in heaven and for many years they reaped massive financial gains from this. It made, they started out, I remember it because I was at the first launch event for digital recording on digital videotapes of music and the idea was the first CDs were so extremely expensive to produce that they warranted a much higher retail price. And once the distribution, or once the manufacturing cost dropped, dropped dramatically, the price remained the same. And if you look at the, the curve over the years of how much money they made from CDs, it, uh, it dwarfed what they made on vinyl. It's exactly because the produ production costs can be made, made so much lower. But of course, what they did, if you look at this in terms of digital innovation, they created the news they, that ended up being around their own necks. Namely, they transformed the music from analog uh, movement of a needle in a groove on a record or magnetic magnetization of tape going past the tape head. They changed that to a stream of zero and ones that once combined with the Fraunhofer's Institute's MP3 algorithm for compression, the ability to buy cheap storage, the ability to distribute this on the internet, and cheap gadgets to store this on these memory cards, you suddenly had this ability to really um, transform this arrangement from one where there was a very stable assignment of roles between different institutions. That the, the, the record producers would have the production, means of production to, pr to press records, vinyl records, or CDs. They would then, uh, uh, be, the music would be stored on, this, uh, on the CD or the vinyl, it would be played only on a very limited set of technologies, so either a record player or a tape deck, and it would be distributed in record stores or official outlets for this, for this kind of human activity. And the point was, of course, that the, the digitizing it uh, allowed this process to be uncoupled so that you could then suddenly, with Napster, distribute the music on the internet. You could play it on any kind of device that had a general purpose computer that allowed some, some form of unpacking of this digital stream to, 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 to noise and to sound levels. And uh, as a result, if you look at the distribution of music, this has uh, really been challenging for this industry. There's been an industrial upheaval. So it's not only what happens within one organization. It is really uh, this notion that uh, in terms of the distribution and production of music, Mick Jagger famously stated, 
I was lucky. Uh, I started playing music just when you started making serious money on it, and I finished now that you can't anymore. <laughs> So if we link that uh, digitalization of the production of music, then you could say, uh, when I used to play in one of the earliest punk bands in Denmark, uh, we, I was desperate because I was a drummer and I was not very good at keeping the pace, it's, which is quite crap for a drummer, that's why I'm an academic, I'm slightly less crap as an academic than as a drummer. The point is you could buy a little drum machine and it cost 400 pounds in 1978 money, which would be probably about 2,000 pounds now. And I, I begged my band member colleagues that we would spend our little surplus of money we'd earn on this, but they couldn't see the purpose of it. If you look at the means for production of music today has meant that any, any teenager with a laptop can, for no money other than a laptop and the internet connection, can produce music at the technically the same quality as anything produced in the studio. Indeed, if you look at most popular music produced for ordinary public consumption, it's produced by somebody in their office or bedroom or their digital studio. So the professionals have adopted the work arrangements of amateurs. And this is only possible because of digital technology. So this notion of democratizing, of driving down the cost of the means of production and means of distribution. To me, uh, the way to understand this process much hinge on some understanding of the nature of digital. Otherwise, we cannot, we cannot understand it. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, that if we only attack this problem based on our assumptions about how the world is organized, then we, of course, will miss lots of things that people who have other marketing, uh, strategy, all sorts of other perspectives. So, uh, so my main argument would be exactly that uh, we can uncover some part of that story, whereas I think in IS, we have, we have in the past had a very insular approach to problems that relate to organizational technologies, namely that we should be an expert on all aspects of it. And, and I think the way that the complexity of the problem is so that we can no longer assume we will also be experts on strategy, on organization design, on this, on that, but, but really to try and understand more clearly what kind of expertise we bring to the table. And my expertise is not that I know Heidegger. I don't know shit about Heidegger, I can tell you. <laughs> Because I'm not an expert in Heidegger, but I'm an expert in other things. And I think the soul searching of the IS field from within is to really try and work out, so what is it we can do that others can't? Now, our biggest problem is then to try and convince these other people that this is the case. And I think there's a great terror of us being marginalized because technology is now important everywhere. And that means the strength of a field is not only the strength of, of our ideas, but the strength of how we are able to convince others about these. And the strength is often associated with how old the field is. So that the older the field, the more this field have an institutional power to, to punch through what it sees as is the right decision. Now, I'm just going to collect my thoughts here. So that brings me to the last point I want to point out, which is, uh, which is what I see as the, the biggest challenge for the IS field is that uh, this is my, I mean, the, the guy, the guy, the CSW journal who reviewed my book, he said this is a technological determinist uh, account of affairs, and I took that as a hallmark, uh, not as an insult. <laughs> so the point is, for me, uh, because I still see myself as some sort of half-baked computer scientist, I think the strength of our field and our le legitimacy of being here is the extent to which we understand from a fundamental and theoretical point of view, what goes on in the world of technology. So the second we uh, do not keep up with what goes on, we will, we will be uh, more and more, increasingly more and more irrelevant. And so the paper I'm writing on at the moment is one that argues that the, that the information systems field is not sufficiently what I call academically agile. So, uh, so I know I talked against using the concept of agility to Florian, but uh, you know, <laughs> The principle of rules is you shouldn't necessarily follow them yourself. So the point is, my argument is simply that I do not believe that we as a field should engage in every single fad and fashion that goes on outside in the real world. But I do think we need to ensure that our institutional arrangements and our, our, the process of acquiring and accumulating knowledge should be, in a sense, agile in a way that it very quickly makes sense of new phenomena 
for them to decide whether these are of any substantial difference from previous phenomena. So I remember we had a big discussion here when I started in 99, where there was departments in the UK that started calling themselves Department for Multimedia Studies. And I remember Presenti saying, this is crazy, what if something else comes along? And it was right, it was crazy, because it was based on this notion of multimedia cd runs And this was, everybody believed that this would be fantastic, and that in Malaysia, this dentist that ran Malaysia for a while, he made it so that the whole country was built up on being a multimedia <laughs> super, super corridor for multimedia cd runs And now they probably have huge uh, landfills on it. So my point is exactly that every single technological change is not substantial in its own right, but we as a field are terribly bad at understanding what constitutes something significant in you. An example I have used is the example of mobile uh, telephony and mobile ICT. So if you look at the basket of eight publications from 2000 to 2014 out, so the December, January 2000 to December 2014, 3.2% of all articles have anything at all to do with mobile ICT. Now, there's no number given by God of any denomination, Abrahamic or none, that states that we should have a certain percentage. But my argument would be something that commands the most of the world's population pockets and purses. We need to at least decide that it is nothing new, and we have still not decided that. And this was, it is 12 years ago that Kelly Lutin and Young Jin Yu wrote an article in ISR saying we need to make sense of this. We still have it. And I think uh, our main problem is we still are left with the organization as the unit of analysis. So most new technologies that we take up in the IS field that are characterized, in my view, by, by filling the same kind of footprint as the previous ones. So instead of the mainframe, in the basement, it becomes big data. It becomes C e uh, ERP systems, CRM systems, it becomes cloud computing. It are things that are not distributed. It are things that you can pinpoint in an organizational context. And I think this is our Achilles heel, and unless we start understanding the dynamics from digital dust to global infrastructures, we are not able to talk to people from the rest of the management department about current phenomena that are important. That's it. it was a problem. You can go on stolmiddel.com, s t a a l m i d e m dot com. You can see me. <laughs> we have some videos. Yeah. I'd be happy to send it to you. I don't care. We, are, we all look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Let's instead ask our guest, Michael, not to share his point. Okay, I don't want to speak very long because I think we need to get into um, an interaction, but. I'll just say a few things that might connect some uh, dots, but since uh, colleagues have taken uh, the opportunity to say sort of where they're coming from or came from a long time ago, uh, might as well do the same for the sake of symmetry. Uh, uh, so I come, uh, so I'm, my PhD is in political science, um, but I also have a management degree uh, before going into my uh, doctorate. I taught at a public policy school uh, for 10 years. Uh, which was truly interdisciplinary, no departments, uh, and that kind of thing. And I was working <coughs> in, a, in a, a field that wasn't well structured, uh, didn't have a clear identity called public management. And I can't say that it, today it has that clear identity <laughs> either. And so many of the <coughs> much of the angst you heard in the previous presentations I've experienced, but in a slightly different context. And, and um, I'm sort of still determined to do something uh, about it. Uh, after um, being at a public policy school in the U.S., I came to the LSE 20 years ago. Uh, quite a dramatic difference from what I had experienced before. <clears throat> in particular, I moved from a professional school, American professional school setting, uh, back into the core university, in particular because I had an appointment in the government department, uh, something I had no equivalent to uh, uh, previously. But I was also in the Interdisciplinary Institute of Management, which was set up in 90 to be a the forerunner of the Department of Management. And, uh, and uh, that was an interesting experience because I got to see how LSE was re responding to the idea 
of um, being a, uh, an LSE academic institution with an interest in management. Um, uh, I guess I would say about that experience, because it has covered my responses to my own job, uh, that um, it was, a, it was a very interesting, very demanding intellectually. I uh, got exposed to, in particular, uh, epistemological ideas, methodological ideas that uh, were, uh, were foreign to me. I mean, not that I wasn't doing them, but the, the sort of uh, rigor with which the ideas were uh, explained uh, were very odd relative to my past experience. Um, and in particular, I'm referring to Peter Abel and uh, much of the work that he's done on case studies and other narrative explanation and, and the like. But what was um, peculiar about it, about the Institute of Management, was that there wasn't any uh, particular affection for the study of management. <laughs> 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 it was uh, uh, an interdisciplinary uh, program or organization, a scientific organization, within the social sciences, um, and it lived off teaching management, uh, in fact, but it wasn't really interested in the subject, and uh, that that uh, was a recipe for making all sorts of appointments, which uh, for you know people who only were incidentally or aspirationally interested in the in the study of uh, management. And so. some of them actually asked at the appointment I've had, "Why are you appointing me in the department of management? <laughs> I'm so so expert, and I'm not interested in exactly this." <laughs> so so. Um, so here we are, you know, uh, 15 years later, 20 years later. Um, I don't know how much you really need to know or want to know about the um, sort of local, present institutional context, because I'm not sure how much bearing it has on the issues that with which you are uh, concerned. But it's possible that some of the issues the department has to struggle with as a department are also issues that individuals coming into the field with management, or perhaps even IS, need to struggle with at the individual level. So my guess is there is a little bit of uh, symmetry between the struggle at the department level and the struggle at the individual level. Uh, but I'll admit that the reason I think there is that kind of parallel is because I'm still struggling at the individual level, and I'm projecting this on the department. <laughs> <laughs> so I can easily see a connection between what's true at the individual level and what's um, so here, I think what you might want are a few uh, kind of uh, reference points, things you might spend your time, you know, things that are worthy of your attention um, as you make your own way through the early part of your career, same, same things that we have to do at the department level. So one thing, we, one, one point of uh, entry into that is to say uh, research is an important uh, part of the study of any subject and of, of the work that we do. That's an obvious point. Um, but uh, I think we need to go beyond that and reasonably quickly say that teaching is part of it too. Not only because of the business model, but uh, because the study of the subject, I think, is uh, has to be geared, at least in part, uh, to the education of the people who come to study. And of course, the people who come to study management have different motivations Futures than uh, the people who study uh, the science of sociology. But, so I think we should think of our question as what should the study of our subject look like for studies, research, and teaching? And we can think of those as being part of a common enterprise, even though the imperatives and pressures are quite different from one the other. So let's take the research side. And I, I think the, uh, you know, the concept that I would find useful to work with here is a, is a very ideal concept about research. Uh, it happens to be a concept you, you come across in promotions processes and hiring processes. And there's basically a notion of uh, academic excellence. Okay? Uh, and I've seen that concept applied or just come into the conversation, um, you know, again, in promotions and appointment processes, not only here, but on the external and other universities in the year. So it's a quite ubiquitous sort of collection of values. And when there are when they, when they when there's a little specification of them, three values come up uh, and they go together in an interesting way. Uh, one is the 
one would expect most originality uh, of the, you know, the work. Okay. Knowledge is not, you know, there's no contribution to knowledge unless the contribution is original. Okay. So originality is an important uh, piece. Um, you wouldn't be also surprised uh, to hear that rigor is another uh, value uh, within the idea of academic uh, excellence. And uh, the third one is significance. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, so when you write ahead of the department statement when you're evaluating other people's arguments and you're just kind of looking at the research and you don't really, are not really interested in the quantity of stuff produced, but you're interested in its quality, you kind of force yourself, it's not really a checklist because these things are really, these are not components, these are just aspects of academic excellence. So you might want, I think that's a good ideal to try to live uh, up to. Uh, my sense is that uh, in this institution, and maybe uh, many that you might come to uh, work for, the your the, the sensibilities around those values, because they basically we're talking about people, how people respond to work, they try to relate it to these uh, values that they live by. Right? The sensibilities develop in the disciplines, in the social science disciplines. They develop more so in the disciplines than in the subject areas of management or others, more narrow subject areas of other minor professional teachings. Um, and if there's anything to that, I mean, I know my sensibilities about rigor and, uh, uh, and originality and significance comes from being trained as a political scientist, and I know that covers my responses to people. So I, I think an implication of that is. Uh, um, it's good to have a, a, an intimate relationship uh, with one of the social science disciplines or disciplinary domains. Um, uh, I think what is what feels like significance, what feels like rigor, uh, differs across these, these disciplinary domains with obvious qualification that some of these disciplines have competing uh, epistemology and so on and so forth. But at least we know what competition between uh, ideas of academic excellence looks like and that's the thing that so I think that, so therefore one of the, as you pursue a career, if you want to feel like you, if you recognize as someone who understands and pursues academic excellence, there is an advantage in spending uh, some intimate time uh, with one of the uh, disciplines. For me, the list of disciplines are, in alphabetical order, as I like to say, uh, behavioral sciences, economics, sociology, sort of political science, but I'm using that name before it comes back. So that's uh, one. Now let's let's suppose now we move from um, research to uh, the teaching uh, uh, part of the study of a subject and, and thinking about management. So uh, my my picture is that the people that we want to teach people who are interested in problem solving, thought of in an analytic sense. Okay, so problem solving at any scale over any time frame, but it's uh, in Sir Herbert Simon's terminology converting existing conditions into preferred conditions. Uh, and um, the work of uh, converting in initial existing into preferred conditions is done in the field, it's not done in the lab or the classroom. And it's not done, uh, and it's not done by um, a single actor facing uh, an environment, it's done by um, some um, structured set of relationships among people over a period of time. And it's not done in a moment of time, it's done over time. So it's not like there is the firm making a choice. There is a number of people interacting in a determined uh, location, uh, conceptually, over a period of time through which choices come to be formed, come to be acted on, come to be ignored, and so on and so forth. Um, so the problem solving process is what I'm describing there. It's a creation of process. Now our role as educators is to uh, prepare people to uh, convert existing into preferred conditions better than they otherwise would have done if they hadn't come here. Fine. What does that mean? So prepare to do it. I think that sort of means that they are not just going to be responding to the situational cues as to what they ought to be doing. They're 
they're not supposed to just make everything up on the fly as if there haven't been any prior experience in the world of doing that kind of thing. It, they're not going to proceed as if no one has ever thought analytically uh, or systematically about the kind of problem they're solving. So in other words, not trial and error. Something that's whatever, whatever, else, whatever the alternative is. There are lots of ways of problem solving other than trial and error, but it's certainly not pure trial and error. Uh, and then the question for us becomes, in part, how do we teach people how to uh, uh, be an effective uh, contributor to the process of changing and misfitting to the good conditions? We do need to do that. Like any professional field, this is just from the science idea of, 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 of artificial science, people need to be uh, given some knowledge of how to create novel, significant patterns of behavior and uh, artifactual. Well, they're, they're going to do that if we can teach a bit of that. It's not specific to management. And the way people are taught to design things, this is what I mean by design, uh, will be probably similar in a management school, an architecture school, uh, public policy school, and so on and so forth. Not particularly unique. What is it that uh, then uh, is part of the study of our subject of management? The, uh, we have to, we should think that we are providing people with knowledge of kinds of problems okay, that they might see themselves as solving in field situations. So the key concept there is knowledge of a type of problem, type of field problem, knowledge of a type, knowledge about a type of field problem. And should, and our, uh, our uh, and they, there would be to our advantage as students of the subject not having you know infinite range, you know, infinite number of uh, types of field problems within the study of our subject because efforts are just too disperse. You'll never be able to have academic excellence if the topic is shifting uh, from one study to the next. And there's a certain advantage of uh, stability uh, over time in the you know the taxonomy, the classifications, the four types of And then probably we want to choose them because we, we think that the, that the kind of research we're capable of doing is the kind of research that will create academically excellent uh, contributions to knowledge about that type of field problem. Um, so that's all very abstract. Now if I could just come back to maybe relate that to some of the previous uh, 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 presentations. Um, uh, I think that um, I think the, the theme here is that there's a strong aspiration for work done in IS that is academically excellent in the originality sense, uh, the rigor sense, and the significance sense. I think there is a recognition that for any field that's defined by a subject matter, not a discipline, uh, we have to. There's a kind of a public good called a, called common understanding of significance. Okay. Uh, you know, I think there's an understanding that a lot of the sensibilities about, about rigor will come from broader disciplines. Okay. Uh, well, a sense of originality will come from being a good scholar in your field, okay. uh, whether it's the disciplinary field or the subject matter. But I think there's a conversation about what would be significant. And it seems to me we, we have a reasonably uh, small and stable list of uh, types of field problems. Uh, uh, then, uh, and we keep saying those are important field problems. We will we'll begin to solve collectively the significance problem. I mean, compare, look at the economists, right? They have a very small, the ones who are studying organizations. They have a pretty small list of types of field problems. It's convenient that the field problems flow more from their theories than from anything that's but you know the point still stands by constantly repeating that you know, designing pay systems or uh, choosing uh, or designing the ownership systems or designing decision right systems or uh, they you know they only have like five or six things right they know how to teach a course on it everybody teaches the same thing and they sort of agree on what the field is so after repeated exposure you think that they're significant now I think uh, uh, we should you know, do some of that now. 
what I heard today. Really? Sure. <laughs> Some of that. Now, it wouldn't be, I, wouldn't, I don't think our definition of probably should follow from our theoretical commitments, okay? If they should come from our substantive views of what it is people need to know or ought to know if they're going to develop uh, solutions to problems uh, and something other than a trial and error basis. So, so the digital innovation, so what I heard this morning is sort of, let's, uh, let's pick a kind of problem domain, digital innovation, that is distinctive from the problem domain that would be studied by others who fit broadly under the study domain. Okay. So that strikes me as promising. Okay. And that then raises a question, um, well, what's, what's the problem? You know, maybe we need some problems clear specification of what the problems are in that domain. Uh, problems that recur, problems about which we can develop uh, some, um, some knowledge. And, and then there's another question, which is when we're particularly representing the knowledge to, that we've developed about a subject about a type of problem, when we're representing it to students, what do we want to highlight? Uh, what do we want to, what should be the form in which we express it that they hear time after time? So for example, you know, there may be an advantage in helping them see what would be the causal sources of disappointment, failure, waste, harm, things that, that are inherent in trying to reach some intention. Okay? So be clear about the problem side of the problem. Not don't stop there. You want to also be clear, uh, develop an idea, ideas about the form uh, of the solution uh, to the same kind of problem. Understanding that the solution, understood kind of functionally, is that which tends to suppress the causal process that moves toward failure. And it seems to me if we put a priority on that, the, uh, the knowledge we're at least presenting will have more significance for people and it will be more useful to them when they are uh, trying to do something by being by that is just trial and error. And, it, and it's quite different than reporting information about developments that are going on in the, in the real world. Although, clearly, by studying the developments, you will, uh, you will change your understanding of what the problems are and what, what the solutions are. So this is a kind of kind of uh, view about the study of management that is very much uh, informed by, say, the Herbert Simon science is the artificial view. It's not specifically design science. In that sense, it's a tiny local argument within the overall scheme. I think this, uh, this idea is, uh, is, uh, fits well with the management uh, department because uh, you can see that academic excellence is required for both teaching and learning, for both, both teaching and research. Um, and that uh, although we think that college has an important role to play in problem solving, People who actually have to do the problem solving are not us, it's others. And they have to do so through their own learning and practitioner learning over time, and not simply by recalling uh, um, you know, technological rules, technological knowledge they, they acquired here and um, attempting to apply it more or less. Michael will be back on Tuesday in our PhD seminar to talk about design science, which is also a contentious issue in information systems, so it's your opportunity to hear more from you. But let's jump into the discussion now, so if you all have thoughts or questions, but I'm going to share something to kick it off. Um, what I found interesting also about Michael's presentation is to see how the Department of Human Management had the same issue finding its place among the existing disciplines and groups. And I guess on the one hand, it shows how all the disciplines are arbitrary and socially constructed. On the other hand, I guess it shows that we have something in common in trying to find our spot in the world of social sciences. But what I really wanted to ask the panel is, do you think now that we are part of the Department of Management, we have found the right place to be? Or is our history as a subject and as a department so different that we want to have issues fitting in in terms of topics, epistemologies, research methods. Any thoughts on that? I'm not sure thinking whether it is the right place helps very much. <laughs> it happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's 
not an irrelevant place. As I said, mm -hmm. this is, in a way, this brings us closer to the international IS uh, academic community. But um, the Department of Management at the LSE, and I guess that's what I hear from uh, uh, Michael. Michael has his own view. Uh, others may have other views. It is part of the challenge of creating a Department of Management mm. at the LSE. So um, we have to make it right. We have to make it productive. We have to make it a place for um, uh, constructive, for, for flourishing careers. We have to make it known in the world as a center for excellence. More questions? Uh, thank uh, all of you for three very thought-provoking and uh, always um, uh, reflections. One thought, uh, potentially one concern. So to what extent do you think we need, at the present stage, uh, in IS to frame our research as a digital innovation research uh, to define our identity? So to what extent uh, is uh, digital innovation important as a way for us to distinguish ourselves within the community. And uh, I, mean, I would say potentially concern in the sense that uh, coming from uh, an interdisciplinary perspective, but with uh, a focus on uh, how innovation matters with context, uh, um, uh, I've always found personally myself uh, comfortable within uh, framing my research in that way. Um, uh, I wouldn't find myself equally comfortable in uh, shaping my research as a digital innovation. I do a city for development. I, do, I deal with the innovation, uh, with context relevant innovation. The, the technologies I deal with uh, could be hardly framed as particularly innovative in our westernized logic. So uh, I guess the whole idea is to what extent do we need digital innovation to distinguish ourselves? Well, I was suggesting that this is what I want to do, but I would leave it to anybody to do whatever they want. But I think that the whole the whole point is there's a constant battle in academia between, you know. So this is the our discussion the other day about Florian's PhD, uh, namely the issue of uh, ambidexterity or organizational ambidexterity is a constant battle between exploitation of existing categories and then exploration of new categories that can help us. So. So I think uh, there's an obvious political reason why uh, we as a field may think about using the term digital innovation because, you know, I had a meeting today with two prospective students for next year. They're all brilliant students, both brilliant students, and they only came to talk to me because we had changed our name to digital innovation in the title. Now, this is a completely different concern. This is the, on the teaching side of how do we recruit the best students. But for me, uh, it's obvious that good work is good work. And, and I, so I think if you look across the whole department, you know, you, we should be able to do good work that fulfills the three criteria, originality, originality, rigor, and significance. All I'm saying is that I look at myself as the only competitive advantage I can bring to the table is what my core interest is in. But, but I think the whole idea of being at a, a department of management where we hope, hopefully can, can achieve some sort of synthesis between our different interests and skills is by having a, a, a different combination of how we use existing categories and how we break through and, and reformulate categories when they don't fit. And so we, we, should, be, uh, we should be bold enough to dare any kind of uh, iconoclastic notion. I, that's, that's not my purpose. I don't think I would want us to decide what is interesting and what is not interesting. That's the storefront, the, 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 the advertisement you put up. But I think in terms of the real substance, I think there's a, a lot of work to be done. I think the biggest problem is exactly how we engage in a meaningful debate about what are the stable, you know, what Mike talked about, what are the stable aspects we want to study. And within IS, we have, uh, as long as I have been in IS, there's been four main stable aspects, the four main research questions. And I'm beginning to think that some of those might need reconsideration. There's how do we design technology, the process of design of IT. The second one is, what does this IT do? How does it change the people work or socialize? Or, so it's like the effect of it. And the third one is by far the largest category of IT, IS research over the years is how do we make people use it? How do we change the, how do we solve the problem of organizations using the technology? And the fourth one then relates to beyond the organization of markets. So these 
if you could, I would guess this is Peter Peter Bike's um, talk in '98, and he 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 mentioned these four categories as he saw the stable concerns within IS. And it's clear, I would say, there's issues on two-sided markets, on platforms, on infrastructure that I've been studying that doesn't really fit into a clear notion of the market alone. And it, it's sort of beginning to soften a bit, but my main concern is to what extent we can get a, a real proper synthesis by, you know, in a sense, any kind of specialization as an academic, you turn into a two-year-old with a hammer. That everything looks like nails. That that it looks like the only way to study this. So this is the, of course, the idea of the, your epistemology and your interest. It is the only way to look at this, and and for us to somehow engage in a debate with others, and we can only do that, I would argue, if we have a clear sense of what we can contribute with, but also uh, quite a lot of humility and not try to be able to solve all problems. But uh, you know, we cannot rely, I would argue, on. Uh, proper development in any academia if we try to force categories on others. I think we, you know, as an academic, we should be allowed to question categories and take the consequences. Um, hi, thank you very much. It was really interesting. And um, I was thinking a little bit about these uh, sort of relationship between disciplines and subject area, which I think has been uh, the core of different uh, contribution, but also something um, which is really uh, interesting for collaboration with others. For instance, I can see myself uh, digital innovation um, or social media. Uh, I can see myself doing uh, interesting stuff with others from other disciplines by relying on a subject area. But then, for instance, digital marketing. But then is where there is when the discipline and the different discipline come back with their set of uh, different epistemologies, which are linked to, for instance, different journals. Then how to proceed? I mean, this is something that we can work on, reflect upon how. Yeah. Um, if I follow a little bit where I said uh, I am now, which is I give a lot of significance to substantive questions. In that respect, probably a different bit from um, uh, Carsten, uh, who said it's interesting that we have to understand the digital. And my question is, OK, we understand, so what? Yeah. The so what is something that has significantly missing from what we are doing. And I believe that it's a challenge and I believe we should do it. And if we do that, it will take us very much compared to interdisciplinary. While I very much agree with uh, uh, Michael, academia is institutionalized in long established disciplines. Simply these disciplinary kind of boundaries with their internal discourses and uh, very streamlined ways of thinking, using data, putting together uh, theory and uh, abstract thinking and data, it seems to me is, um, it doesn't serve uh, the purpose of having something interesting, substantial to say, <coughs> significant to say, about uh, issues, problems, developments that require arguments about. And I would like to see our community forming arguments. So on one hand, there is this convenient, proven path of following a discipline. The questions that emerge from that Try to understand from this discipline something that happens, and you are almost guaranteed a publication and a career. And on the other hand, there is this amazing, challenging range of phenomena that we come across as researchers, which invite us to draw from multiple disciplines. And there is a discourse, and there is some kind of uh, more permissive academia encouraging crossing disciplinary boundaries, but we know 
it's more difficult to publish, more difficult to choose. Does it fit in this? Very often, I've seen this very much, very often. Interesting research that has something to say goes from one journal to the other. The editors from one journal says yes, but probably it should be published in a journal of that uh, field. That's very unpleasant. This is very unproductive from junior staff. It's something probably that uh, more established uh, academics can afford. But uh, I guess, particularly for the most established, it, I take it as a little bit my duty to challenge this kind of disciplinary defined rigor. I think it is possible to be rigorous. I think it is almost imperative to, to be interdisciplinary to be able to be significant and original. And but I know that it is challenging. Just to comment on that, I would argue that we should not define our strategy for, for what would work for the top five percent of academics. The point is I, so when you find if you mention examples of people who have managed to do something of that sort. I would argue that the successful ones are not the average middle of the bell curve academics. They are the outliers who might have been successful no matter what way through their energy. I think this is, this is like the use of methods in systems development. They are meant for the average. They are not meant for the, those who are outside the scale. I think that would be my issue with interdisciplinarity. But there not there a tension between what's good for the individual researcher? Yes and what's good for society as a whole, knowledge Definitely. as a whole. Because if you yeah. just focus on what's good for the researcher, you push everybody into the middle of the curve yeah. and you need the chrysanthemums to say there yeah. is this other space. So it's, it's an interesting tension between yeah. well, the, the, the exploitation, the, exploration argument, you could yeah. say. And, and, and I, I think it's a real problem that the university sector is going to face increasingly is how you both, how you address the, the two of them between being interesting and adventurous and giving everybody a job and a career path and the publication of life, etc. Um, I just remark that if you're, um, you know, the fact that you're part of a larger department means there's more people who are colleagues. And the, and the question really is how do you exploit that possibility yes. without it taking up every hour of the day? <laughs> So, so almost everybody, uh, except those of us who 
study strategy or strategic change, both are, are concentrating in one or another area. Now, if you could then compare what your interests are with theirs, you can see uh, what it is that you know because they're not looking at it at all. What, what, is, what is it that you think is significant about what you're doing? Because they're not paying any systematic attention to it at all. And then you could, if they are paying systematic attention to the sort of same things you're doing, then you can compare how, it, how you do it versus they do their doing it. And that actually tends to produce the most interesting conversations. So that's one thing you can do about figuring out where you are relative to the, uh, the subject areas, but it's study of management generally. On, on epistemology stuff, I, I uh, yes, I talk about this a lot. I, I, I was, I'm very interested in what Andrew Abbott wrote in his book Chaos and Disciplines. As he basically said, you know, there are any known, you know, there's I don't know, 2,000 combinations of methodolo methodological choices you can make in a very large number. Uh, actual, dis actual fields or literature tend to have made, uh, only actually are uh, made about uh, two or three clumps of common combinations of choices. So if you want to study the history, you know, look at the choices they kind of made. And he gives you, it's, he's, this thing's really good about breaking down stereotypes. He says there are stereotypes called the quantitative methodological manifold and the quantitative methodological manifold. But if you kind of break that down, you'd see that in many fields, you know, there's three of one, three from one side and four from another, and, you know, and some choices of both was on both sides on the same dimension. I would use that to track the you know, kind of qualities of uh, commitments of the people working in the literatures. And then you'll be able to pair uh, much more easily and not with the uh, not viewing it through the, the sort of lens of uh, stereotypes that you use maybe to say that's that's something else. Well, what I, so I would argue based on my experience I have uh, I've done a little bit of sort of discussions with people from especially OB. And the, I think the uh, very good example of it is uh, I spent eight years living with an OB person while she did her PhD. And she did a fantastic, it's a very good PhD, and it was about uh, innovation in knowledge intensive firms and how you sustain the ability for the firm to constantly come up with something new. <clears throat> and she had a fantastic chapter on technology. But then when it turned out that the PhD ended up a bit longish, that was the first one to go. <laughs> and so I, if you look at Andrew Sturdy and his colleagues, they've written this brilliant book at Oxford University Press on management consultancy. You can look through the book. I would venture you would not find a Blackberry anywhere. You'll not find any technology anywhere. Although if you study that practice, it is inherent to the way they're able to construct the world and produce knowledge and insight and share that, there's an, that the technology plays an integral role. So I think what's interesting that I have hopes for the future of is exactly that what I find in some subject areas and possibly even in some epistemologies or some particular churches of belief that the technology is this not even a black box but it, it doesn't exist. If you look at one uh, Olikovsky and Susan Scott's paper from Annals of the Academy of Management where they went through management journals and say, okay, materiality, the, the real world, how is it represented? And very much as you said, you know, it's not there. It is largely not there. And the, and the point I have there, I mean, that's right. no, that's right, yes. But the point is, you know, the point is, if it is not interesting, um, why, what would the incentives be for anybody else to talk to us? So if you look at it from their point of view, you know, what, why, what, what can we contribute to that discussion if what we are inherently interested in are some underlying relationships which are, are deemed perhaps less interesting, that this is not what it's really about. So you, so you rightfully say that we have a, a place to, we have a role to play for looking at places where the others don't look, but that's only assumed that we can contribute by saying, well, really, this is really interesting, and they turn around and say, you're right, it is interesting. But I mean, my sense is that, um, that you have a lot to say about the relations, about two things in my list. One is the enterprise, Yes, is the kind of site of technology. Yes. Okay. And about uh, history, uh, which is the category I use to talk about system, to suggest that you talk about systematically about change. Yes. Okay. And, and in the management literature, the people who are interested in both of those things at the same time say they're interested in strategic change. Yes. So you say you're interested in strategic change, but you have a, an angle on this that is uh, uh, by virtue of having studied for a long time. Yeah. Artifacts and the 
that different aspect. It's also, also also interesting to hear from Chrysanthi about the uh, hidden CSS LS, even the Department of Information Systems was one of the intellectual hotspots. And I thought it's kind of interesting that it's not more the case nowadays because obviously information systems are becoming more and more important in every area of life and shaping all the other social sciences as well. But when I meet somebody from within LSD and tell them I'm studying information systems, they don't even know what it is you didn't have to explain that I'm not a computer scientist. So well, they didn't necessarily know it during the time of Gibbons. They always know that. Even yeah. Gibbons didn't yeah. know. <laughs> so how can we increase our visibility or the, how can we become better known in the LSD community? I'm sure a couple of scandals would do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure Michael would recommend that. Well, that's certainly one, one question, is the, the, staging, the staging of your interests for others. Yeah. But another issue is, you know, why is it, uh, why might it be difficult to progress in the study of strategic change along the lines that are um, your cup of tea, the lines that you have the most experience in with in terms of producing an academically excellent work. Okay. That's a big challenge, right? And it seems to me that um, uh, there are um, a couple of directions and answers for that. And but I'm going to think of what is deeply the problem there. And one uh, one problem is that uh, the uh, discipline on which you try to draw this some of you try to draw it, for example, Yanis, uh, to uh, pursue academically excellent answers to those questions in sociology. Okay? But um, uh, there are a couple problems. And so this has been working hard on tech. Sociology doesn't take technology seriously. So part of the problem, okay, in terms of putting money back in the kitty, is yeah. that you need to uh, kind of reorient sociology, which keeps him up uh, you know, all weekend for nine months on papers. Uh, and then there's, there, and then you say, okay, so we're going to make more use of sociology for the study of our subject. No. But what about the, you know, the teaching? How does that relate to the teaching side, so to speak? The problem is sociology, unlike economics, for example, has no account of design and stuff. It doesn't give a damn about it. Okay, so we have, so we have to figure out a way to make study of management influenced by ideas of academic excellence that come from sociology relevant to problem solving. When on the whole, in the field of management, uh, people coming from sociology have been the, you know, the skeptics about the relevance of knowledge for problem solving. It seems to me, uh, for people like me who like the kind of sociology of like science, we need, to, we need to bend over backwards to have an account of how knowledge will be useful for those who are engaged in problem solving. And that's sort of the background of the whole problem. Yeah. And the economists don't have to worry about that story. It's obvious their theories of the world uh, look like theories of design because they construe theories of design as theories of choice. Okay? Uh, it's, it's a great, you know, it's a great work if you can get it. You know? <laughs> it's a nice story if you can tell it sincerely. The right? OB people um, basically uh, have an easy story to tell, right? Uh, everybody knows for somehow what, how they want the world to get better. They know that people and their interactions matter. Are telling you that people aren't what you think they are, and if you accept that, there's obviously managerial implications and the story. You know? So they've got, I don't think it's very line, but they've got a line. Those of us who are coming at the subject of management from sociology to the science don't have a good line about that. Okay? Uh, so you've got a dual problem, right? Technology isn't important to sociology, and sociology isn't that important to problem solving. But if we kind of acknowledge those fundamental problems, I think we can actually work on them. But well, there is not a sociology, level. there is a whole field of the sociology of technology. So we are not, we cannot say anymore that we only draw from these sciences and we have to make the connection. There are lots of colleagues in sociology, in political science, in history that are interested in technology and they are interested in more uh, recent phenomena of communications. And there is something else about the, no, I think yes, absolutely. And I think we have to go beyond this uh, kind of, we have internalized this uh, identity of we are different, we are isolated, nobody understands us, uh, people don't know what is information system. Well, that's a bit of our own problem too. Many people, uh, and that's why I said, if, uh, said, if we start 
uh, presenting our interest not in terms of labels but in terms of substantive uh, problems. We find lots and lots of other people around in all sorts of social sciences that we have complementary uh, uh, knowledges and ways of communicating. Earlier on today I attended a, a presentation by somebody who studies uh, basically technology innovation firms and he studies what sort of control and governance and ownership regime uh, produces better effects to simplify the uh, concern. And um, totally from a different kind of uh, theoretical uh, uh, direction. But so complementary. Technology was there. He didn't talk technology. He didn't mm -hmm. say it's a design issue. Right. But I could add that. And I'm sure we, if we uh, could sit down and have a coffee, we could find all sorts of interesting ways of uh, communicating. It is a little bit uh, like, you know, in that respect, I guess is like my other aspect of identity, being Greek. The Greeks always think that they are different from the world, and the world doesn't understand that. No, 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 <laughs> that, that, that one is true. <laughs> <laughs> I can categorically <laughs> say But it hasn't been any good for us thinking about that. No, no, that's not my problem. <laughs> Well, I want to just to have a, a little point there because if you look at it, uh, in a sense, in a very simplistic imagery, is it was very easy studying OB when computers were human. So when when a computer was made up of human beings, you would calculate on pieces of paper. The point is now, if you look at the increasing computerization of the HR function, then if you just look at that little problem, you, I would venture, uh, my hypothesis would humbly be that when HR is increasingly automated and codified in procedures that run more or less automatically through individuals being managing themselves vis-a-vis -vis some system of rules and regulations, to study HR will also need to involve studying these rules that are embedded in these systems. And that I don't see. I see, uh, you know, I, I live by stereotypes, so I see people putting their fingers in their ears and going la 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 la, and it's not happening. That, that, that they are interested, it's like young girls of seven, what do you want when you grow up? I want to have something to do with people. I want to be a nurse, it's about people. The point of it is, organizations are designed through very clever combinations of codified behavior that are embedded in rules and handbooks, but also in technology. And I, if you look at the current debate outside here, where the science uh, members of the, the British Science Society, and all they talk about the future of AI is going to take over, and all these cataclysmic consequences, it's based on assumptions about the relationship between organization performance, uh, the performance of state organizations, and then, and then performances of these technologies that, in, I would argue, in some way, that you might choose not to have an interest in it, but it becomes more and more difficult to, I would argue, to get to the essence of what is happening with that. And I think, therefore, the challenge we have is to be able to engage in a constructive debate on a certain topic with whoever are experts in that topic from their perspective, and us joining from our perspective. And I, I think that the complexity of the arrangements of the design of companies and organizations global supply chain arrangements is, is such a, uh, a complex endeavor that it cannot be covered in any meaningful manner by one field or one discipline. So, so, I, think, so I think in that way, I think, is slightly my frustration because I think it is, you know, I don't want to be an expert in OB, but, but if we need to understand it, I, there is, you cannot understand it from only one perspective by pretending computers are human. Or not important. Because we are offloading more and more decision power to these automated arrangements. And this is, uh, to the extent I would argue, we as a field don't even understand to, to a large extent. Moving on with the problems, uh, I believe you have several, and you have very nicely described some of them. But one of the key issues is to distinguish between fields and disciplines. Yes. And uh, information systems, as a few other academic fields, isn't the discipline. Despite being called like that, economics is a discipline. Psychology is a discipline. They have fundamental assumption on the basis of which they can make and make observations en masse. And on the basis of that, they reflect the impact on the theory and they go on the road. We are hodgepodge. <laughs> and that's the interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, it's a big challenge. And that's what I think all the anxiety we express here is to some degree as a 
by the phone money. And there you are, between, I would say, and I say, a Greek. Skill and Charybdis. Ah, <laughs> that's what I was about to say. You can. That's where we are, and this kind of anxiety, I think, we are bound to live with. But within this, we can do better. And that's the challenge. And how can we do better? I think you said very many reasonable things. But it's good to keep that into the background and know that it's not going to go away. No. It will be there. I seem to be adding concerns to concerns. I'm sorry, but in terms of the, from, uh, that's, I'm, uh, I finished my PhD eight months ago and uh, entering the wonderful world of academia, so I'm justified in playing the concerts. So, um, uh, uh, to what extent should we think of epistemology? So, one of the points that Kizant in particular raised that today is that uh, epistemology does distinguish us, especially as the LSE within the IS domain. So, to what extent does uh, epistemology and the lexicon in which we interact uh, represent uh, anyhow a problem in terms of uh, communicating across fields. I mean, it's, uh, mm, I couldn't write uh, my development papers in a nice language, that is for sure, but I couldn't even write uh, my development papers with an IS uh, epistemology, in the sense that uh, the kinds of questions, the kinds of uh, um, uh, they are somehow bridged, I would say, by the idea of focusing on substantive, substantive issues that uh, Kizanti was uh, mentioning. But uh, the core epistemologies of the two fields are very different. And uh, well, I speak as an ICT for development person, but uh, several of the people in the room uh, bridge different domains as well. So I'm wondering, I guess, uh, to what extent should we think of uh, epistemology of the epistemology that characterizes us uh, as a constraint in terms of communicating with other fields? I don't think it is a constraint. I think of epistemology as something which uh, you need to, you always have it, but you need to consciously uh, cultivate and develop it in the sense that it really um, helps communicating to others what you are doing, how you understand your problem area, how you approach it, and how do you do research. And you need to be, it seems to me, really very consistent and truthful to whatever you are doing for the uh, whatever epistemology. That is, how you understand the world, how you, you uh, create knowledge in a consistent uh, way. Uh, if you don't, if you pick and mix different methods that have different epistemological roots, you may really make uh, mistakes, but probably you yourself will feel it, uh, that uh, you'll feel uncomfortable about that. So this is something which I think is an individual debate that we have ourselves and effort to uh, develop uh, their uh, way of thinking. With several methods that uh, we combine, so case studies and ethnographics, for example, um, which uh, might go together and you will have to feel that how they go together and they are uh, consistent. Um, if you develop this and as you develop it, I don't think this is necessarily or not necessarily, it is not an impediment to communicate with others and present your research and your findings, um, but it does require some kind of uh, acceptance from the others. So a mistake that people often do is to be naive in the sense that not, they are not aware about uh, preferences by editorial boards. <coughs> and that's where the conventions that have been invented by particular epistemologists um, trends to uh, develop credibility uh, and ease the way into uh, publication is, as I said, very useful, but on the other hand, it can be very limiting as well. But uh, I suppose it is important, particularly when you start your career, to develop epistemological integrity and follow the conventions so that you are able to publish. And gradually you might be able to play with it and open it up so that you are uh, do it better in the way that you believe is better. Well, for, 
I would, I would argue if you look at the, uh, if you look at fairly narrowly our field and the ability to, to publish within the core journals in that field, I would argue there is sort of increasing a premium on innovating in terms of what you do. That there's in itself this this idea that uh, in the beginning uh, God created M.I. Quarterly and uh, Gordon B. Davis was right next to him, and then and then you could only publish certain kind of papers. It was very very difficult to penetrate this outlet, and of course through a long movement that that sort of uh, a pinnacle was was Alan Lee becoming the editor in chief. <coughs> And suddenly, people started to publish there from other from other positions, and I I think that the increasing availability of data uh, of data sources means that we also will see we already now can see innovations in how what kind of research you do, and the point is of course that whether you want it or not, the second you somehow start as in our case start collecting relatively large data, uh, source of data, then you somehow, you are forced or coerced into thinking about it differently. You might end up doing very deeply qualitative analysis of some parts, but you also, you know, start thinking about it differently. Uh, and in that sense, I think, as a field, I think we, we, we are changing in how we perceive what is considered mainstream research. That, you know, a typical mainstream European IS research agenda would mean a case study and maybe longitudinal case study, but it would, there are lots of things it wouldn't imply that increasingly now we, we can see. And I think that's extremely positive, but it also, of course, is a risk, especially for young academics. But, but I, I think we should be open for various kinds of innovations in what kind of data we use. And if that, for example, brings us more into doing archival studies, historical studies, uh, panel data studies, or you know, studies of other of, of the disciplines, I think we should be ready to learn from them. But I, I think it's something that I feel is going on. As an as an editor of a journal, I can see you get different kind of papers, but but it is not something that I have seen too much discussed. Maybe because I don't go to many conferences. Uh, but this, I think, we need to have a more a more mindful approach to how we do this, and this is not really discussed. Ever. But I think there is that the time is right for us to start thinking about collecting different kinds of data, and that also, to me, means that we end up having possibly more constructive discussions with people we normally wouldn't discuss with. But of course, epistemology is not only what data no. we use, but uh, what is it? Our thought process and our yes. explanation process. Yes. So consciously, in a way, I got into the very controversial domain of arguing about causality and interpretivism, yes. for example. But that's something I suppose that um, you don't do when you try to publish your first papers. You don't <laughs> take an interpretation. Unless you do it, it works. <laughs> Or you take something which covers you, something like uh, crypto realism, which people will recognize. So in a way, you, it is useful at the beginning to write on an existing wave, rather than trying to create new waves. Gradually, however, I expect that all of you will indeed create new waves. Actually, that's our biggest hope. Being, in this, being teachers, that you will create waves that we have not been able to. But the thing is, that this model is a major rift yeah. in uh, in academic research. A major rift divide. Yeah. Uh, it is, and one of the biggest problems is that you find people in which stand on the other side of the rift. And you try to say what you've done, and you, it's just like hitting the wall. Yeah. There's no one. Absolutely. This is a major problem. And I have been trying the last five years, at least I'm here, because I have been experiencing this problem, which became even more acute as we joined the Department of Management. I to try to find ways to build some sort of a bridge, even a fragile bridge. I haven't been able to do it. Well, yeah, but, but, we have to but I don't think the solution, and I want to emphasize that, the solution is not to be a little bit of a positivism and a little bit of interpretivism, for example, in the same research. Because many people try to fudge it by, yes, I'm expecting both. It doesn't go like that. It cannot possibly no. go like that. No. 
you can only really get deeper in your insights through the way that you feel that it's comfortable for you. You develop and you cultivate one way of uh, understanding the world and explain. Mm -hmm. But then it is important at the same time from your own perfected way of presenting how you think to communicate with others. And I understand with uh, what you and say, and it is frustrating. It is frustrating in here. It is frustrating in the IS field as well, because that's we have we feel we have in the field the same problem that we have in the department. We are a minority in the field, very much respected in the department, perhaps less so. But uh, nevertheless, it is this kind of divider. We are who we are, and uh, there the others. There are occasions that I see that this divider is crossed in debates. The best example for me for this kind of communication happens in the IS field in the PhD consortium. The PhD consortium, it is possible, probably because co uh, colleagues, I don't know, uh, put the best of their self <laughs> in <it. laughs> Yes, uh, but you don't find this kind of absolute divide and people try to see and genuinely the see, value of that. See, I think that Michael said before, there is a book, two books by by Andrew Abbott, and both of them are dedicated to this fundamental problem. Mm -hmm. One is called Methods of Discovery, and how to combine and cross-cut these divides. The other is the chaos of the discipline, where he discusses historically a little bit more substantial problems. And both, I think, are fantastic. They were written as a pair. For, uh, yeah. Chaos was written first, and then Methods was written as a um, student-oriented version of the course. That. Yeah. That's a very good book to whatever you understand. So, um, I feel sorry to have to interrupt the discussion. You see, almost we could go on for. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but we can make time for the discussion with the public. Can I go and have a seminar now? <laughs> 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 no, I think it was really interesting. Um, <laughs> I would particularly like to thank all of our panel again, so let's leave them with a nice round of applause.